Israel. Then she pursued her ocular oncology fellowship from Wilson Institute, Thomas Jefferson University, Philadelphia, USA. Her research interests are in ocular oncology, ocular inflammation, ocular infections, ocular autoimmune diseases, and uveitis. She has many publications in various international peer-reviewed journals. She has received many research grants and various awards from 1994 to till date. The latest being the STEAM Award from Shiba Medical Center, Tel Aviv University in 2021. We are honored to have you here, Dr. Victoria. Now I invite you to give your talk on ocular manifestations of hematopoietic malignancies. I request the audience to post their queries in the chat box. We can take it after the presentation. Over to you, Dr. Victoria. So thank you very much. I'm really honored for the opportunity to be part of this wonderful meeting. And I would love to share my uh, presentation with you. So in this presentation, I will uh, give you an overview of uh, all the, or several of the hematopoietic malignancies and their ocular uh, involvement in, uh, in those diseases. And then I will focus on some of the novel uh, findings. So generally, when we talk about hematopoietic malignancies, we grossly divide them to leukemias, which are um, dividing, which um, involve the bloodstream and bone marrow and lymphomas that involves the blood, the actually usually the lymph nodes and some of the viscera. And uh, I will follow this division. I will first talk about lymphomas and uh, the ophthalmic involvement in lymphomas and then leukemias. So uh, I will uh, try to uh, focus on intraocular presentation because this is what my main uh, point of interest. So the intraocular lymphomas uh, can arise for in any different in any parts of the eye, including the orbit. But I will try to focus on the intraocular presentation, and they will present in a wide clinical uh, manifestation uh, range, usually masquerading other diseases like uh, uh, uveitis and infections. The diagnosis of intraocular lymphomas are really challenging because of uh, uh, the fragility of the cells. So when you want to take a biopsy of the vitreous uh, uh, or in the interior chamber, you have to take that into account and uh, you have to communicate with your lab and uh, inform them that you are sending fresh tissue or fixate the tissue in spot with uh, liquid fixation because otherwise the cell will break and the diagnosis will be impossible. So sometimes, uh, and some labs are using other indirect uh, uh, labs like uh, interleukin-6, interleukin-10, and others. But the main um, uh, diagnosis lie on uh, biopsy, which is hard to confirm. So again, the correspondence between you and your, the uh, communication between you and your lab should be very, very uh, close before you perform the, the biopsy. Now, when we look at the clinical feature and uh, as the biopsy is really hard to uh, confirm, we will lie or rely uh, on diagnosis on our um, ex clinical examination and the presentation of the patients. So we basically divide the presentations of intraocular lymphomas into two. Is it the retina and the vitreous cavity that is involved or is it the uvea that, that is involved? Uh, when we look at the retina, then usually uh, we will name the lymphoma retinal lymphoma, uh, vitro retinal lymphoma, or vitreous lymphoma. And when the uvea is uh, um, uh, involved, then we would like to first uh, be, be, be more precise. Is it the choroid, ciliary body, or iris? And when it, it is the choroid, then we need to determine whether it is a primary or secondary uh, in involvement. So in retinal uh, uh, lymphomas, usually we talk about uh, the most common intraocular lymphoma, the most common form of intraocular lymphoma. And usually uh, you cannot uh, uh, differentiate it from vitreous lymphoma. It is usually, uh, and vice versa. There, it's very rarely that only the vitreous is involved and the retina is not, and, the, and vice versa. Usually we talk histologically uh, about uh, high grade or aggressive diseases, aggressive malignancies, and usually we have to look for CNS involvement. 
the CNS involvement could be simultaneously presented with the uh, retinal involvement, and we need to ask the patients or the family whether there are um, memorial problems or any uh, sensory or motor uh, uh, dysfunctions. Or sometimes it can precede the CNS involvement in several years. So we need to be very, very tentative and we need to uh, involve the uh, hemato, neuro hemato uh, oncologist in, your, in our uh, uh, hospital and make sure that the patient is followed up, not only ocularly, but also um, from the, from, by doing ser serial MRI examinations. So this is a disease of the elderly population, usually over the, 60, the, year, the, year, the age of 60. And usually it is a bilateral disease, although it could be asymmetrical. And sometimes we suspect only in one eye, but we need to be very carefully examining the other eye because if you look for it, you might find some subtle uh, uh, um, involvement uh, signs in, your, in the other eye. And again, going back to the histology, most of those cells will be B cells rather than T cells uh, uh, lymphomas. And it is important because it could um, influence the choice of our treatment. So these are some of the manifestations of, of uh, leukemia from uh, Sarah Copeland's uh, publications. Uh, you can see how the retina could be involved in a pinpoint uh, uh, subtle infiltrations that are very, very um, uh, nicely demonstrated on fluorescent angiogram. And on, uh, uh, on the plate C, you can see how the vitreous could be uh, um, concomitantly with the retina involved and actually obscuring the, the view of the retina by the massive uh, vitreous infiltrates of cells. Okay, uh, so let's talk a bit, a bit about the treatment of uh, intraocular lymphoma. So the traditional treatment include today low dose uh, radiation. It's a very, very effective treatment there would be in, uh, regression of all the ocular uh, presentation, yet uh, it will be accompanied almost always with uh, uh, local uh, radiation complications and sometimes even uh, uh, CNS complications. Uh, intraocular methotrexate uh, injections is an effective and established treatment, and I'll show you the main publication in a minute. Uh, it can... Um, um, clear the vitreous and the retinal signs, but it, it could cause uh, local uh, side effects like keratopathy, hypotony, and even macular edema. And uh, sometimes those uh, complications are reversible. And when you stop uh, the treatment, uh, everything will uh, regress. As I said, most of those lymphomas are B-cell lymphomas and therefore using anti-CD20 uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, mainly rituximab is uh, a good option. And we can use rituxim rituximab both systemically and uh, direct intravitreous uh, injections of rituximab, which is tolerable, uh, yet regression uh, was reported. So just to show you that uh, intravitreal methotrexate uh, uh, treatment choice is uh, actually well reported and documented. This is a 10 year report of uh, our colleagues from Jerusalem. And you can see how uh, um, all the signs in plate A, the massive vitreous involvement, the massive um, uh, optic nerve infiltrate all regressed after treatment to uh, a clear vitreous uh, uh, in this case. So I'm uh, presenting this um, article because I would talk about lymphomas, leukemias and some novel treatment in leukemias. And I will actually base that talk on this uh, uh, article that uh, summarized 10 years of experience. Now let's talk a bit about uvel lymphomas. So uvel lymphomas uh, can be further subdivided to the part that is involved, choroid iris and the ciliary body. This is a very, very rare presentation. And I would like to, the iris and ciliary body presentation is anecdotal, only few case reports. So therefore I would like to talk about uh, the choroidal uh, lymphomas, which is more prevalent among those rare presentations. And to say that this is a primary choroidal uh, uh, lymphoma, you can only say after 
um, uh, by uh, negative uh, uh, definition after you rule out negative, uh, you rule out systemic diseases because otherwise you have to regard this as secondary involvement of the choroid uh, as part of the systemic disease. So typically this is a low grade and indolence disease, unlike the, the vitro retinal lymphoma uh, that is aggressive, as we said, uh, that could kill the patient. This is actually a very indolent course disease, and usually it is unilateral. It is more common in men than women. Again, this is a very uh, el elderly population over the age of uh, 60s, usually six and seven decades and more. And the treatment usually, we actually term it as uh, um, similar to pseudotumor of the, uh, in, of the eye, intraocular pseudotumor involvement, and we, we regard it as a lymphoid hemiplegia. Uh, there are aggressive forms of, uh, uh, of uh, choroidal lymphomas, but they are very rare. Uh, when the patient has proof of uh, disseminant disease, visceral disease with lymph nodes uh, or vis other viscera involvement, then we call it a secondary disease. And the most common uh, uh, in, um, uh, form of lymphoma is uh, the diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So this is an example from uh, Sarah Copeland's uh, article of uh, choroidal lymphoma. Actually, if you look at it carefully, it looks like uh, any choroidal tumor and the differential diagnosis is uh, actually very wide from uh, the differential diagnosis could be even uh, amelanotic melanoma or metastasis and you need to biopsy it and to prove that this, the proliferation cell, the proliferating cell is actually a, a lymphocyte. And now I want to introduce you uh, briefly to intraocular leukemias or generally leukemias. So intraocular involvement in leukemias are again, very, very rare. There are only very uh, um, few uh, reports uh, summarizing uh, or demonstrating ocular involvement in leukemia. And um, in terms of uh, clinics, it could be the presenting sign of leukemia it could appear uh, after the diagnosis is, uh, uh, of leukemia is already established and the patient is known to have systemic leukemia, or this could be the first uh, manifestation of relapse after remission. So what would be the mechanism of uh, involvement, of ocular involvement? So the, the mechanism of ocular involvement in leukemia actually could be divided to three types. Type number one would be direct intraocular infiltration of tumor cells, of, uh -huh. of tumoral lymphocytes to either part, any part of the eye, anterior segment, vitreous, choroid, or retina. It could mimic uveitis, could mimic choroiditis, and retinitis. Uh, this would be direct intraocular infiltration of tumoral cells. The tumoral cells could infiltrate uh, extraocularly, involving the extraocular, the nerve, or other extraocular cranial nerves, or even the orbit. And if it uh, infiltrate the orbit without intraocular involvement, it could mimic actually orbital inflammatory disease. So you need to be very tentative, you need to suspect, and you need to think of biopsy to prove that this is in fact lymphoma, or I'm sorry, that this is in fact leukemia and not uh, other type of uh, white blood cells uh, infl inflammation. Um, so what would be, if we take all the publications regarding uh, ocular involvement of leukemia, we'd see that the most uh, common or the most frequent uh, presentation would be posterior segment uh, involvement. Now, the involvement of the posterior segment could be uh, just hemorrhages, uh, and the hemorrhages sometimes could have a white center, and I'll show you in a minute uh, an example. Uh, the white center um, uh, mimics, mimics the road spot, actually represent direct uh, le uh, leukemic cell infiltration, or it could be secondary to conditions like anemia or other types of uh, blood dyscrasia that uh, accompanies leukemias, because there, there is sometimes in leukemia a secondary a hematopoietic changes, not only the infiltrating cell, but 
uh, anemia and uh, trauma cytopenia. Usually if the presentation includes cotton wool spots, it will be uh, attributed to nerve fiber layer infarcts localizing at the, the center of infiltration. And there could be also peripheral uh, micro uh, or macro aneurysms that could be si chronic signs of leukemia. And here you can see two examples. This example includes mainly hemorrhages that could be secondary to anemia and thrombocytopenia. And this example, you can actually see the white blood cells. This is what we call rot spot like or white centered infiltrate. And this could represent both anemia, but also direct infiltration of leukocytes. And this is really, really important because we will treat differently if it's hemorrhage is secondary to blood dyscrasia, and when it is actually a real tumor cell infiltrate. So um, what do we know about uh, intravitreal or uh, uh, vitroretinal leukemia? So this is again a very, very uncommon disorder, but it was already uh, described by Ziminar in uh, 1964. And uh, usually it only uh, affect a small population of the patients in, in, with leukemia. But on the other side, we need, to, we need to be honest and say that we do not uh, traditionally examine all the uh, patients with leukemia. We only examine patients uh, with leukemia that uh, uh, actually complain, they have ocular complaints. And uh, it could, uh, actually be, as we said, secondary changes or accumulation of malignant cells. It could affect patients in any age, and I will show you a detailed case of an adult patient and a detailed case of a child, three-year-old child. And usually it is not the presenting feature, not like in lymphoma, vitreoretinal lymphoma, when uh, the vitreoretinal uh, manifestation could uh, precede the CNS manifestation in several years. Uh, and again, it could be, as we said, the first manifestations of relapse, because sometimes the patient is cured, but in the, in the eye, the eye is a sanctuary site where the tumoral cells could survive. Usually this is a very poor prognosis, prognostic survival, uh, prognosis sign for survival. And if the patient has no CNS complaints, we still have, even if the patient has no CNS complaints, we still have to explore the CNS involvement of these patients with leukemia. We have to, we have to request that the patient will have a CSF uh, sampling. And if it is positive, it has, the patient has to be um, uh, treated both intraocular and in the CSF. The most characteristic lesions in uh, leuke is leukemic retinal infiltrate. I'm talking about uh, when I'm talking about direct uh, involvement, not indirect involvement. And here you can see two examples. This is one infiltrate. You can see that it is uh, retinal and subretinal, and this one is actually retinal. You can see that it is obscuring uh, the blood vessels. The infiltrates could be unifocal or multifocal, and it could involve one eye or both eyes. Now, some presentations are rare. You can see some uh, cotton wool spots in wood, wool, cotton uh, wool spots in this case, and you can see exudative uh, retinal detachment secondary to the uh, infiltrate of the of the retina and maybe the color. Other types of infiltrate could involve the optic disc, as in this case, in the upper case, you can see that the direct infiltrate is actually obscuring the, the retinal vessels. So we know it is uh, retinal and it is uh, above, above the retina. Uh, the choroid could be infiltrated and the iris, like in this case, leading to uh, a pseudo epopion or hemorrhage, like in this case, and the blood vessels could be uh, involved in any part of the eye. Uh, in the um, pediatric population, 
and there is actually one uh, a large a cohort of 60 eyes that uh, were examined during acute leukemia. And we know that uh, in this uh, um, uh, sole um, uh, publication, because this is the largest series, usually uh, the ophthalmic uh, manifestations are not screened. This was the only uh, um, uh, publication where there was a screening. And you can see that uh, the infiltrates uh, involved in 40 3% the choroid, in 13% the retina, and in 10% uh, the optic nerve. So what are the traditional treatment methods of uh, uh, direct uh, involvement in, uh, in choroidal uh, leukemia, in, uh, in intraocular leukemia? So usually we use systemic or intrathecal chemotherapy. And this is a problem because we all know that uh, the blood retinal barrier prevent from the uh, systemic and even intrathecal chemotherapy from uh, penetrating the eye. So it is good enough uh, for the uh, optic nerve involvement, but it is not good enough for the vitreal involvement. And this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, the vitreous and the retina sometimes, and even the choroid, sometimes are sanctuary site. And even though the patient seems to be uh, cured, uh, there is a relapse from uh, the uh, ocular uh, a sanctuary site, and I'll show you a case just like that. Uh, so the other treatment method is in radiation, and again, the complications could be atrophy, and uh, usually the irradiation is uh, low-grade irradiation. So what is the prognosis? So this is uh, if the optic nerve is uh, involved, uh, there will be a profound uh, loss of vision, especially if we irradiate the eye, and usually this is a very, very bad prognostic sign for life. So I would like now to uh, spot on our uh, experience in the Shiba Medical Center in Tel Aviv University. So um, we uh, use the same protocol as I uh, presented to you that was used for uh, um, intravitreal lymphoma since we, uh, we know that this is the proliferating cell is actually from the same origin. We took the same uh, um, a treatment protocol, which is actually 400 milligrams in uh, 0.1, or today we use 0.05 mLs, and we um, uh, injected it directly to uh, uh, 11 eyes of six patients. Uh, in all those patients, we actually biopsy proved direct infiltration of uh, the leukemic cells into the eye. We excluded patients when there was only hemorrhage, but no uh, white centered uh, um, infiltration or even if there was a white centered infiltration, but we could not prove uh, by biopsy that this is uh, leukemia. So we actually had patients that were all biopsy proven. And uh, we, we followed the, the patients up uh, for almost uh, a, a year and a half in some cases. And uh, at the end of the follow-up, we saw that all the ocular manifestations were actually very, very, very uh, dramatically improved. And I'll show you uh, two cases in a minute. Uh, looking at the prognosis, uh, at the end of the follow-up, only 58% only of the patients were alive. Uh, some of the patients uh, actually died after a short follow-up because of their severe disease. So now I want to show you uh, two cases as demonstrated case, one adult case and one uh, pediatric case. So this is a 56-year-old female. She presented with blue vision and black spots. She was very, very sick. When she presented, she had B cell ALL. And um, uh, she failed, as you can see, chemotherapy protocols and bone marrow, marrow transplantation. And this is her presentation. You can see how the vitreous is in, uh, he's infiltrated with uh, a, a, a huge cloud of uh, of infiltrate of uh, inflammation and infiltration, and you can actually see the infiltrative cells in the optic nerve. This is a direct infiltration of the optic nerve with secondary hemorrhage, and I can actually see that even the choroid is infiltrated. She was uh, uh, here. You can see a closer look of uh, the optic nerve infiltration. You can actually see how the infiltrate. Um, uh, covers the blood vessels. And this is in fluorescent angiogram, the same uh, demonstration. And you can see how nicely she reacted uh, to intravitreal metotrexate injections. Again, we use the same protocol as established for lymphomas. 
And here you can see that after five injections, the, the, the vitreous cleared and the optic nerve infiltrate began to clear, leaving a very, very severe, uh, you can see here there is a severe uh, uh, optic atrophy from the infiltrate itself, but you can see how nicely uh, she regressed. And even in um, red free, you can actually now see the blood vessels that uh, uh, were obscured before. Uh, she ended up uh, seeing 615, which is a good uh, uh, a vision uh, for uh, the eye uh, to begin with. And this is uh, a demonstrative uh, pediatric case that I want to share with you. This is a three-year-old girl from Gaza that was treated uh, in, uh, uh, in Gaza. And she was referred to uh, first to Jerusalem, to East Jerusalem, and then to us with visual acuity. Of course, uh, she didn't complain, but her parents complained that she is bumping to things. And uh, she doesn't see when they handle her uh, some toys. And uh, she has also a very, very, very uh, massive history. Uh, she actually presented with CNS involvement. She presented with the uh, left fascial nerve palsy and vomiting and um, uh, thrombocytopenia. She was treated uh, before uh, coming to our center with bone marrow transplantation. Uh, and um, she was treated uh, uh, with the chemotherapy, intratecal and intravitreous chemotherapy. And she was actually on remission, but of course no one checked her eyes. And when she came to us, she has no fix and follow. She had clear anterior chambers and the uh, normal fundus, normal uh, intraocular pressure, but this is the fundus photograph of her right eye. You can see that the optic nerve is deeply infiltrated with the cystoid changes. And this is uh, uh, the periphery of the right eye. You can see that only the peripheral retina was attached. Everything else was exudatively uh, detached with massive infiltrates. That of course is, is uh, a classic um, example of sanctuary sites in the eye. No one treated the eye, and this was the site from where the uh, the relapse began. This is her left eye. You can see massive vitreous infiltrate and massive optic nerve infiltrates. This is another uh, view of the left eye. And on ultrasound examination, you can see how the infiltration actually is protruding the vitreous cavity on uh, both eyes. And this is her MRI, and as we stated, she was on a CNS remission, but her eyes were filled with disease, and this was the source of uh, her recurrence. So to prove that this is actually, or this is in fact, uh, a vitreous, uh, vitreous uh, leukemia. We took uh, um, uh, samples because, of course, in the differential diagnosis, in such a sick patients, we can think of uh, uh, other uh, vitreous uh, uh, sources like uh, CNV or HSV over its zoster, but she was uh, cytologically biopsy proven to, uh, to be a vitro retinal a leukemia. And this uh, treatment has uh, implications in children because we cannot inject children like adults. So we had to actually use a frequent anesthesia and we did. We injected her under anesthesia, and you can see uh, slowly, slowly how the vitreous cavity uh, and the retinal infiltrates uh, regressed. Uh, and also, you can see the sonographic regression of her disease. And this is after eight injections in both eyes. And she did develop uh, a keratopathy. You can actually see here. Uh, the keratopathy, which was treated with uh, um, um, uh, actually, um, uh, um, st we stopped the injections for a few uh, weeks and uh, we uh, re injected her when the keratopathy resolved. And uh, this patient uh, uh, um, actually uh, survived a little bit longer. She is uh, now 13 years uh, old. And uh, we hope that we will see her um, in many, many years to go. So if I, I would like to summarize the vitreoretinal leukemia, this is an uncommon presentation. Usually this is a sign of advanced disease. And usually there is CNS involvement. 
sometimes uh, uh, the patient is um, actually presented initially with the CMS involvement and the occult of tonic involvement is secondary. And usually it is a sign of poor prognosis. We know now that if the patient has CMS lymphoma, we need to uh, urge the, the hematologist to send the patients for routine ocular examination. And if the patient is presented with ocular manifestations, we need, even if uh, the patient is not known to uh, suffer of CMS involvement, we need to rule out CMS involvement. Uh, we can, uh, from our experience, we know that uh, using uh, uh, intravitreal methotrexate could uh, allow us a good local uh, response and should be considered as um, an adjunctive therapy. We need to know that it does not treat the other eye. So if uh, both eyes are involved, we need to inject each eye separately. And it does not cover uh, the, the brain. So the patient needs to be treated uh, by a hemato a, a neuro-oncologist. Um, either intrathecally or by uh, irradiation. And we need to know that these patients can develop uh, corneal epiteliopathy. I would like to thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to be part of uh, this uh, wonderful meeting. I would like to thank our uh, team in Shiba, the ophthalmic team, and uh, the pediatric and uh, the adult hemato-oncology. So thank you again for uh, the invitation. Thank you for the excellent and very informative presentation. We have a few questions in the chat box. Uh, first is from Dr. Pradeep Sagar. He wants to know while planning the surgery for vitreous hemorrhage or the retinal detachment in CML, what precautions are required in terms of hematological parameters? So first of all, you need to uh, make sure that the patient is well uh, controlled from uh, uh, st the standpoint of uh, blood dyscrasia because you don't want to end up uh, clearing the vitreous from uh, the existing vit vitreous hemorrhage and creating a new vitreous hemorrhage. So sometimes you need to uh, make sure that the patient is receiving, if needed, it depends on the blood dyscrasia that the patient uh, uh, have. Sometimes even uh, you need to uh, make sure that the hematologist will treat the patient with uh, blood supplements. That's the first uh, aspect. The other aspect is if you cannot see the retina um, and you cannot uh, uh, exclude direct uh, uh, infiltration of uh, leukemic cells, then you need to prepare yourself because when you start clearing the vitreous, if you see that there is uh, white blood cells infiltration, uh, I think it is very, very important to take the pure samples and to send them freshly uh, to uh, the um, to the uh, pathology or cytology, depending on your uh, establishment. And if you cannot do it freshly, if there is no one there to accept it from you, please fixate them with using liquid fixation as um, uh, used in your institute because uh, it is different from institute to institute. And of course, I'm you're welcome to email me, and I will uh, um, email you our protocol and how we handle those cases. Uh, if we don't know what would be the status of the retina and uh, the blood vessels, if you open the the view and clear the vitreous, and there is no uh, uh, blood white, there is no direct white blood cells involvement. Uh, in the vitreous uh, or retina or blood vessels, then you are good to go after cleaning the vitreous hemorrhage. Thank you for your important question. Thank you. Then the second question being whether the ophthalmic manifestations change the prognosis of the lymphomas. So, uh, of course, uh, the ophthalmic manifestations do not change uh, the systemic uh, prognosis. The systemic prognosis is largely depending on the success of the bone marrow transplantation. But if the patient already underwent bone marrow tra transplantation and no one knew of the ophthalmic manifestations, and now you uh, actually find out that uh, there is a sanctuary site in the eyes, then yes, it changes. It is a poor prognosis because it means that the patient is not cured. So the best thing to do is uh, to uh, make sure uh, if the patient is really, really uh, um, 
uh, ill and he has um, uh, ophthalmic complaints to make sure that uh, the eyes were examined and there is no sanctuary site there. Um, so the only, uh, in, uh, the only circumstances when the ophthalmic manifestation changed the prognosis is when it is not known and the patient is regarded as uh, cured, as in remission, and then suddenly we find out that actually he is sick. Then next being, how often do you see a cranial nerve palsies in the hematopoietic malignancies? How many? How often do we see? Yeah. What? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. I didn't so how understand. How often do you get to see cranial nerve palsies as an ophthalmic manifestation of hematopoietic malignancy? Okay, so um, it is not often, it's a rare disease. So we collected, as you saw, we only collected uh, uh, seven patients with direct ophthalmic infiltration. And actually altogether we had 11 patients in uh, uh, I think uh, six years of follow-up. So it's actually rare. And also uh, you have to take into account that we are a referral center. So it's very, very rare, but if the patient complains, then uh, it uh, uh, raises the chances that he has ophthalmic manifestations. So it is very important for us as ophthalmologists to educate our hemato-oncologists and to um, uh, stress them to send all patients, even if they are very, very sick for exam ophthalmic examination, because sometimes there are surprises. You sometimes um, diagnose CNV retinitis, and sometimes you see uh, some signs of direct ophthalmic uh, involvement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of Shankara Academy of Vision, I thank you for your insightful presentation. We are closing the session for now to restart the session again on coronal tu retinochoroidal tumors at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this. Thank you.